Chapter One of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter One. Do you speak German? Hey there, Mister! Called out Jabez Holt from one of the two office windows in the little hotel at Dunhaven. As there was only one other man in the office, that other man guessed that it might be the one he addressed. With a slight German accent, the stranger, who was well-dressed and looked like a prosperous as well as an educated man, turned and demanded, "'You are calling me?' "'I reckon,' nodded Jabez. "'Then my name is Herr Professor.' "'Herr Professor,' repeated Jabez Holt, a bit of astonishment showing in his wrinkled old face. Herr Professor, Barber, eh? Why, I thought you was a traveler. But hurry up over here, do you hear me? My good man, began the German, stiffly drawing himself to his full six-foot-one. It's not often I am affronted by being addressed, so there. You'll be out of sight in another minute while you are arguing about your dignity, muttered Holt. And that's the feller you said you wanted to see, Jack Benson. Benson cried the German, forgetting his outraged dignity and springing forward. Benson, that's him, almost up to the corner. Nodded the landlord, Jabez Holt, running out and bringing him back with you. Directed to Professor Radberg. Be quick. Well, I guess you're spry enough, but I'll return old Jabez with a shrewd look at his guest. Besides, it's you that wants the boy. Running back and snatching up his hat, Professor Radberg made for the street without further argument. Moving along hastily, the German soon came in sight of young Captain Jack Benson of the Pollard Submarine Torpedo Boat Company. Ach, there, Herr Benson, shouted the professor. Hearing the hail, Jack Benson turned and halted. You are Herr Benson, are you not? demanded Professor Radberg, as soon as he got close enough. My name is Benson, nodded Jack pleasantly. Then come back with me to the hotel. You're a foreigner, aren't you? asked Jack, surveying the stranger coolly. I am a German, replied Radberg, in tones of surprise. I thought so, nodded the boy. That is, I don't know from what country you came, but in this country, when we ask a favor of a stranger, we usually say please. I am Herr Professor. Oh, barbers are just as polite as other folks, Jack assured him. His laughing eyes, resting on the somewhat bewildered-looking face of the German. Then please, Herr Benson, come back to the hotel with me. Yes, if it's really necessary, but why do you want to go to the hotel? Because, Herr Benson, when we are there, I shall have much of importance to say to you. Important to me or to you? asked Jack thoughtfully. He had no intentions of answering a much older man disrespectfully, but there was something about Had Ryberg, the air of a man who expected his greatness to be recognized at a glance, and who demands obedience from common people as a right, this sort of thing didn't fit well with the American boy. Oh, it's important to you, and very much so, urged the professor, somewhat more anxiously. Besides, added the German, with a now really engaging smile, I've met your demands, Herr Benson, and have said please. And I suppose I'll have to meet your demand, nodded Jack, good-humoredly. Lead the way, sir. Ha, ah, you may walk at my side, permitted the German. It all seemed a bit strange, but Captain Jack Benson had been through most strange experience and had most Americans of thrice his age. Radberg, Jack imagined, that he had guessed at least an inkling of the other's business. The German announced himself as a professor. Probably, therefore, he was a scientist. Being a scientist, he very likely invented or nearly invented something for use in connection with the submarine torpedo boats and wanted interest the concern by which the young submarine skipper was employed through this guess was a reasonable one it soon turned out to be the wrong one the professor's real reason for seeking this interview was one that was bound to take the submarine boy almost off his feet readers of the preceding volumes in this series need no introduction to captain jack benson nor to his chums hal hastings and epp summers such readers recall as told in the submarine boys on duty how Jack and Howe drifted into Dunhaven just at the right moment to fight for an opportunity to work themselves into the submarine boat building business. How the boys helped build the first of the now famous Pollard submarines, and afterwards learned how to man her. 
was all told together with all their strange adventures in their new life in the submarine boys trial trip was related how jack benson solved the problem of leaving the submarine boat when it lay on the ocean's bottom and also the trick of entering that submerged boat again after diving from the surface of the water the attempt of shrewd businessmen to secure control of the new submarine boat company also described together with the manner in which the submarine boys outwitted them through a successful trial trip and captain jack ingenious ways of rousing public interest the government was forced to buy the pollard as the first of the submarines were named in the submarine boys and the middies was narrated how the submarine boys secured the prize detail of going to the naval academy in annapolis as temporary instructions in submarine boating many startling adventures and some humorous ones were related in that volume then in submarine boys and the spies was shown how the young men successfully foiled the efforts of spies of foreign governments to learn the secrets of the pollard craft and the submarine boys lightning crews the adventures of these clever enterprising boys were carried further in this book was told how the boys were trained in handling the actual torpedoes of warfare the pollard boats benson and hastings were entered in an official government test in which the submarine craft of several other makes competed the desperate lengths to which the nearest rival of the pollards went in order to win were told with startling accuracy the result of all these tests was that the pollard company received from the navy department in order of eighteen submarine torpedo boats the benson and the hastings being accepted as the first two boats in that order by the time the present narrative opens it was near the first of many over at the shipyard where facilities had been greatly increased two of the submarines had been lately been finished and four more were under way in a long construction sheds work on the government's order was being rushed as fast as it could be done while keeping up the pallid standards of high-class work of late jack and his young friends though their pay went on had little work to do whenever a new boat was completed it was the task of the submarine boys to take her out to sea and put her through all manner of tests in order to determine her fitness but there were days and days when the submarine boys had naught to do but enjoy themselves that they fancied shall we sit down here asked jack as he and the tall german entered the hotel office the bees holt stood behind the desk bent over the register in which the professor's name had been the only new one in a week the old landlord pretending to be busy but he was covertly watching and listening sit here repeated professor radberg ach no come along with me there was something rather disagreeable commanding in the german's invitation but jack merely smiled quietly as he followed in the stranger's wake up the stairs they went to the professor's unlocked the door admitting himself and his guest to the outer of a suite of two rooms once they were inside radberg locked the door behind them come to the other room here benson directed the professor the door of this inner room the german also locked remarking now if the man holt chooses to follow and listen he can't hear nothing all this sounds mighty mysterious laughed jack benson good-humoredly however the submarine boy went and stood by a chair near the window and then waited until he saw that the stranger was about to seat himself now asked jack stretching his legs what's the uh, business about i haven't a whole lot of time today listen and you shall hear as soon as i am ready came stiffly from the stranger you are a boy and i am here professor oh you told me all about being a hair professor before smiled jack now see here whether you're really a barber or whether you're just an amusing yourself with me we want to have one thing understood i came here sir as a matter of courtesy to you and you will have to treat me with just as much courtesy otherwise i shall wish you a good morning this was said with a flash of the eye which warned radberg that in his rather overbearing way he was going too far oh my dear young friend he replied persuasively you don't understand in germany i am well perhaps what we call a rather distinguished man at least my neighbors are good enough to say so and in germany when a herr professor talks others listen respectfully just the same with the herr professor in this country chuckled jack when an american barber gets wound up and started all a fellow can do is to listen to him not trying any use to run away from a barber anyway 
guess he's got you strapped down to that chair. Barbara repeated Professor Adberg in disgust. I don't understand you. Oh, it isn't necessary, laughed Jack. It's sort of a Yankee joke. And I beg your pardon, Professor. If I am wasting your time, now go ahead, please, and tell me why you invited me here. There was something of salt water breeziness and Christmas about Jack's speech that caused the German's brow to cloud for an instant. Then, after a visible effort to compose himself, Radberg leaned forward to ask, Do you speak German? No, sir, Jack shook his head. Ach, that's too bad, muttered the German, in a voice suggesting severe disapproval of one who hadn't mastered his own native tongue. However, you will still learn. Yes, if there's a big enough prize goes with it, agreed Jack. Prize, repeated Professor Radberg. You will say so. Then, leaning forward once more, and speaking in his most impressive voice, Herr Professor Radberg continued, Herr Benson, we are going to take you into the German Navy. The professor now leaned back to watch the effect of his words. Are you going to do it when I'm awake? asked Jack curiously. Nein, I don't understand you. Are you going to take me in by force or wait until you catch me asleep? questioned Captain Jack Benson. Ach, don't be silly, boy. I might say the same to you, Professor, replied Jack Benson, composedly. But we'll let it pass. How are you going to get me into the German Navy? And what are you going to do with me after you get me in there? How? cried Professor Radberg. Why, we're going to pay you a very handsome sum of money. And we're going to give you a most honorable position in our imperial service and... Herr Professor Radberg leaned forward once more, lowering his voice considerably. There are three of you boys, all experts at the Pollard works. Well, we're going to take all three of you into the German Navy, and we will do something very handsome for you all. The other fellow will be delighted when I tell him what's coming their way, smiled Captain Jack. Ach, so of course. Now what do you propose to do with this in your Navy, Jack went on? Are you going to make an officer of us? Officers, repeated Herr Professor Radberg slowly. Well, no, Herr Benson, we could not exactly do that. Our officers, as you well understand, very, what is your English word, aristocratic? They could not be quite persuaded to take American commoners as their brothers. That you would not expect, of course. Certainly not, young Benson agreed. If there was a slight tinge of sarcasm in it, it was lost on the German, whose brow cleared as he went on heavily. No, no, my young friend, not officers, but you shall all three have very honorable positions, and handsome sums of money to pay you for entering our service. We in Germany know the rank which you young men have won as submarine experts, and we shall not be niggardly we have determined to have you in our service i hope you pardon me proposed young benson there is just one point that has to be overlooked you tell me that you are authorized to come to dunhaven and kidnap my friends and myself but really how do i know you have such authority from your own side of the water radberg looked a bit puzzled for a moment and as he seemed to begin to comprehend she replied heavily here benson i have already told you that i am herr professor now don't hang out that striped pole again, please, urged Jack. His face is sober as that of a judge. Come right down to the points of the compass. How am I to know that you really do represent the German government? Ach, I comprehend, not as German. Of course you will understand that. On an errand of this kind I do not travel with too many papers. But I shall take you and your two companions on to Washington tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow to do as well as any time, replied Jack, ironically. Yes, I think it will be tomorrow, continued the German. I shall take you to our German embassy, and one of our officials there will prove to you that I have been acting with authority. That'll be right fine of him, agreed Jack placidly. Ach, it is settled then, replied the German, all but dismissing the matter with a wave of his hand. Yet you must bring your two comrades here. They must understand just what is wanted of them. And now, Herr Benson, do you wish to understand that it is to be paid to you to transfer your services? Why, yes, that will be mighty important if we do go under the German flag. If you go, replied the professor, why, that's all settled. 
then i must have missed something by not watching you closely enough murmured jack i shall have to sit up straighter and keep my eyes wider open when was it all settled sir why didn't you not tell me i haven't had a blessed chance to tell you anything replied jack looking astonished you've been doing all the talking but you'll go with me of course to washington uttered radberg looking much taken aback i doubt it muttered young benson shaking his head in fact sir i might as well tell you that it's waste of our time to carry on this line of talk any further your cunning smile professor radberg no longer nonplussed that is as it should be too because you are a clever young man Herr Benson. Thousand thanks, murmured Captain Jack. But instead of talk, persuaded the German, you wish to see some money? Quite right, I should. Were I in your place, Herr Benson, well then, ah, look at this. Thrusting a fat hand deep into a trousers pocket, Herr Professor Rydberg brought up into view a big roll of money. He held this up so that the submarine boy could feast his eyes on it. Jack looked composedly. Did you ever see anything like this? You are such a young boy, smiled the German teasingly. I don't know, really, responded Jack thoughtfully. Thrusting a hand down to his own trouser pocket, young Benson brought up into the light a very comfortable looking handful of banknotes, rolled and surrounded by a broad elastic band. Let's measure the two, Professor, and see how they compare. Ach, muttered the German, regarding Jack's money with some displeasure. Oh, now, Professor, cried the young submarine captain reproachfully. I didn't ask you where you got yours. This is all so much foolishness, cried the German professor, returning his money to his pocket. That's what I think, too, agreed Jack, following suit. It's what our English cousins call bad form to go into comparing piles of money. Now sit down, Herr Benson, and I will tell you what a very handsome sum of money and what excellent wages the German government will pay you to enter our imperial naval services. How much money is there in Germany? interrupted the submarine boy thoughtfully. How much in all Germany? demanded the professor. Nine, how should I know? You expect me, of course, to turn my back on this country for good, to tell you Germans whatever I may know about submarine circuits, to drill with your navy and be prepared to fight in your navy if war comes. Yes, of course, replied Radberg. Now we are beginning to understand one another. Professor, interrupted Cap Jackman Benson. We've had enough of joking. Joking, I assure you, Pro Professor. Once more broke in the submarine boy. I wouldn't sell out my country flag for all the money you ever saw. For a few moments, the professor's face was a study in consternation. Then he broke forth angrily. You are a fool. I guess so, nodded Jack, without resentment. That's just the kind of fools we Americans are, generally. Herr Radberg was a good enough reader of human faces to realize that, at all events, there was no use in continuing the conversation at present. Very good, he growled. You can go. I shall see your friends instead. When you get through with them, tell them they're idiots, grinned Captain Jack Benson. Herr Radberg wasn't a fool. Neither was he a rascal. Expert on offering bribes brought up within the walls of a German university. He would have been willing to lay down his life instantly for the good of the fatherland. Yet he couldn't understand that men of other nations could be just as devoted to their own countries. From Herr Professor Radberg's point of view, Germany was the only country in the world that was fitted to inspire a real and deep sense of patriotism. Oh, no harm done, Professor, said Jack, moving toward the door. And turning the key to unlock it i'm sorry you had all the trouble and expense of coming to dunhaven on a useless errand good-bye you may go but you will come back scowled the other if not your comrades will i hope prove to be young men of better sense and judgment oh they'll listen to you smiled jack good-bye i shall have two of you anyway were radberg's last words before the door of the outer room closed and Jack's footsteps sounded in the corridor. End of chapter one. Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan. Chapter two of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit Lirabox.org. Recording by Kenna Sergeant Gagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 2 French Spoken Here. Well, what do you think of that? It was Epp Summers who put the question, and the time was fifteen minutes later. Captain Jack had met his two comrades upon the main street of the village. He told them, with a good deal of amusement, of his late talk with the German. Hal Hasties didn't say a word, but his eyes twinkled. I wouldn't have minded, laughed Jack, but it was the professor's cocksureness that I was about to be German officer. Ah, uh, he's an old man, asked Hal. That very answered Jack. Perhaps not old enough to know better. But anyway, if we're going to a foreign government, Germany would be about the last country. Germany is our rival in building a large navy. About every other month, the experts in Germany sit down to figure out where they are headed. Are they ahead of us in tonnage or warships? And if so, whether there's any danger of our catching up with them. Now, unless the Germans have a notion that they may need to fight us one of these days. Oh, I don't believe anything of that sort, broke in Hal, shaking his head. I don't believe any country in the world is aching to pick a quarrel with us. No, not when the United States pocketbook is such a fat one, and so well built for paying war expenses, grinned up. Then his look became more solemn, as he added, but we don't want ever to get into a naval condition where it would be easy for some other country to snatch that fat pocketbook out of our hands. Let's go ahead, fellows, drowning in confusion to all possible foes afloat, proposed Hal, the one who could never see war on the horizon. After a winter of hot sodas, it'll be a relief to know the druggist put an ice cream soda today. So the three boys turned and made their way down to the drugstore. While they were exploring with spoons the bottom of their glasses, the street door opened. Herr Professor Radberg looked in, then came in, beaming condescently on the young men. "'Ah, you young men are just the ones I wish to see,' he exclaimed, resting one hand on Epp's shoulder and the other on Hal's. "'Lots of folks would pay for that privilege,' declared Epp solemnly. "'Yes, well, I will pay, too.' You shall see. I shall look for you at the hotel in just one hour. One hour, remember. Have you a telescope? inquired Up calmly. A telescope, huh? inquired the German. What for? You might need it in looking for us, I replied. Then in one hour I shall see you at the hotel. You'll be lucky if you do, grinned Up. I don't know that I understand, responded Herr Professor Radberg slowly. If you're figuring on seeing us, Epp went on gravely, I'm afraid you're in for bad news. Bad news? Ach, what do you mean, young man? Just what I said, replied Epp. Professor Radberg looked so puzzled that Hal Hastings broke in quietly. Professor, unless I'm much in error, do you want to see us about the proposition that we enter the German naval service? Hush, not so loud, warned Radberg, looking suspiciously around. There's nothing we have to keep quiet about, Hal went on. You have already spoken to our captain, Jack Benson, about this matter. Ach, yes, and Jack has refused. Your captain is a fool, cried the German. Then we serve a fool, because he's our captain, retorted Hal, quietly, though there was a flash in his eyes. I shall look for you two at the hotel in one hour, declared the German impressively. My friend, Mr. Summers, has already told you that you'll be using your eyesight to poor advantage, then, Hal answered. What do you mean? What I mean, Professor, that you can't possibly persuade us to go to Germany and tell your people anything that we know about the Pollard submarine boat or any other type. But you shall be well paid. Professor, what would be your price for selling out your country to the United States? asked Hal gazing fixedly at the German. "'You insult me!' cried the German, his face growing red. "'I'm a patriot!' "'Yet you insult us by thinking we would sell out our country,' went on Hal, coolly. "'Are you two going to be as big a fools as your captain?' demanded Herr Professor Radberg, almost incredulously. "'Bigger!' promised Up with a grin. "'Ach, well, we shall talk this over when you come to the hotel in an hour,' replied the German. 
he turned and left the store. Now I don't doubt, mocked Hal, he has gone away firm in the belief that we will keep his appointment. He'll wake up after a while, laughed Eph Summers. After indulging in the second ice cream soda, the submarine boys started down the street toward the Farnham shipyard, where the Pollard boats were being built. As they passed the street corner, they heard a cautious, Sss, sss. Now who threw that our way? demanded the irrepressible Epp turning swiftly. Then he added in a tone so low that only his comrades could hear. Say, fellows, I'll bet that cost something. That was a rather undersized little man of perhaps thirty, dark of hair and sparkling of eye. The stranger's rather pallid face was partly covered in front by a short goatee of the French imperial sort and a mustache whose points were whacked out in fierce military fashion. It was the strangers of Harold that attracted Epps' notice particularly. The stranger was arrayed in almost exquisite fashion. His clothes were of the finest texture and latest Parisian types. His little pointed shoes were almost as dainty as a girl's. Though the day was warm, the stranger was gloved, and handled a cane in the head of which a handsome amethyst stone. I wonder how he got through the custom house, was Epps Summers' next undertone question. Good morning, gentlemen, greeted the stranger, coming toward them, all smiles and bows. Have I not met the mistake, since I am addressing the torpedo boys? Righto, drawled up, regular human torpedoes, as touchy as gun cotton. Why, I'm due to explode this moment. Though the stranger looked puzzled at first, his face rapidly broke into a cordial smile. Aha, I understand you meek what... You the Americans a joke. You have a little fun with me, right? The Frenchman, for that he unmistakably was, laughed in the utmost good humor. The boys found themselves much inclined to like this stranger. Now, young gentlemen, continued the Frenchman, I am the Chevalier de Doré. Glad to meet you, Chev, volunteered up with a suspicious amiability, holding out his hand, which the Frenchman took daintily. I am Chevalier myself, and this awkward, gawky-looking boy with me is our engineer. Epp had a tight grip on the stranger's hand by this time, and was surely making it interesting for the Frenchman. Chevalier Dioré was doing his best to restrain his politeness, but Summer's hearty grip hurt the foreigner's soft little hand. What can we do for you, Chev? demanded Epp, holding the Frenchman's hand so persistently that Hastings gave his friend a sharp nudge in the back. Let's go somewhere, urged the Frenchman. Some place where we can sit down and have ze talk about important matters. I have ze message for you that I cannot deliver upon ze street. No, don't say, please, begged up, that you have heard we wanted to be in the French Navy. The Chevalier looked intensely astonished. But, Blue, you are one marble gasped the Frenchman. You read my most secret thought, but yes, you have made ze one right guess. However, I cannot more say upon ze street. Let us go somewhere. Else. All right, nodded up. You go along now, and we'll be along in an hour. With pleasure, noted the Chevalier, eagerly. But where shall we go? Anywhere you like, suggested Epp cordially. But then how will I know where I am to be found? Oh, we'll take a chance on that, proposed Epp carelessly. But unless I am able to say now where I shall be, the Frenchman started to argue. Well, guess the meeting place as well as we did your errand, proposed Epp. Ten thousand thanks, cried the Chevalier. Yet for freer we must make one mistake, suppose I say. Epp Summers had struck such a streak of guying nonsense that Jack Benson felt called upon to interpose for he and Hal both liked the twinkling eyes and good-humored face of this dandified little Frenchman. Pardon me, sir, Jack accordingly broke in, but if we happen to guess your errand, it was because we have just gotten away from the agent of another government. How is that possible? cried the Chevalier du Rey. A disappointed look came on to his face. Yes, it's true, nodded Jack, but you did not come to any terms with him. Oh, no. Ah, the, the coast is still clear, cried the little Frenchman delightedly. 
so as to where we can meet and make the one talk we can get that all over with right here jack replied we can make you the same answer that we gave the other man we are americans and we never thought of serving another flag even in peacetime chevalier i can save your time by telling you that any arrangement to engage our services away from the united states would be utterly hopeless what's the money began the frenchman protestingly there isn't money enough across the atlantic to hire us jack answered bluntly and the honor honor what would the word afterwards mean to americans chevalier after they have left their own country to serve another the chevalier began to look as though he realized he had a harder task before him than he had expected so you see sir jack went on it would not be in the least worth your while to try to tempt us come what well may we are under the american flag for life you yourself chevalier wouldn't leave the french flag to serve this country great britain or germany no but that's different for i am sure i'm a frenchman and we are americans jack responded i believe you now as the gentleman replied the frenchman in a tone of disappointment but i shall not go away before tomorrow you change your mind or wish to hear what i have to make an offer thank you nodded jack but don't waste any more time on the chevalier and now good-bye the chevalier de ray shook hands with them all most gallantly Epp felt somewhat ashamed of his late nonsense and to prove it hit the chevalier a friendly slap on one shoulder that set the frenchman to coughing hey muttered jack as the three now hurried along the street i began to wish i had a good umbrella Hum, you look great with one reported hal you have stood on the platform deck of a submarine for hours steering unconcernedly when the skies were trying to drown you but i feel remonstrated jack that it's soon going to rain foreign agent i like to get in out of the international wet oh we won't see any more of these fellows smiled hal now that's just where i believe you're wrong miss mate continued jack these foreign governments hire detectives to watch each other when we hear from one we're likely to hear from the whole lot at once look around you Epp. do you see a chap anywhere not a solitary jiu-jitsu fiend responded Epp, after halting and staring both ways and turn along the street well japan is about due laughed benson and now let's get in through the gate of the shipyard if any more of these foreign agents show up well there are two boats in the harbor that are in commission we'll find an excuse to put to sea in one of them just the youngsters i was looking out to try to find hail grant andrews foreman of the submarine construction work as he hurried across the yard mr farnham told me to get out and find you he had sent someone else but i guess the business is rather on the quiet is he in his office queried jack yes thank you we'll go right in then no i wonder what country it is whose agent has gotten hold of mr farnham asked Eph plaintively nonsense mock jack that's what we try to tell em mock ab but the germans are the hardest all three of the submarine boys were laughing so heartily as they entered the shipbuilder's private office that jacob farnham a youngest looking man to be at the head of so large a manufacturing plant glanced up quickly what's joke boys he added i haven't had a laugh since i pounded my thumbnail with a sledgehammer captain jack benson quickly detailed the meetings with radberg and Dure. the frenchman didn't look a bit like a chevalier either muttered Epp. if anything they look more in the german's line well you'll have a chance to get rid of nonsense now for a while went on mr farnham after having enjoyed a few laughs with the boys i have some serious business in hand for you and the time has come that was like the shipbuilder whatever he was planning at any time he kept strictly to himself until the time came to put the plan into operation it's quite an important little job for you up at the craven's bay continued mr farnham you know there are important fortifications there because the navy people expect in more time to use craven's bay as a possible import naval station and shelter of vessels that have to put in 
Now, for some time, the Army engineers have been perfecting a system of submarine mines for the bay. Engineers have a problem on hand as to whether an enemy submarine boat could sneak into the bay and blow up the submarine mines before the Army woke up to the danger. There's a chance that could be done, nodded Jack, musingly. Just so, nodded Mr. Hornum. So I want you to go up in one of the boats tomorrow. The engineer officers at the station will test it out with you whether a submarine can destroy the mines or the mines can be made to destroy the submarine boats. Then the Army engineers will use dummy submarine mines, I hope, broke it up. Oh, of course not, Mr. Farman. Now the trip to Craven's Bay is only an eight-hour sail at a good gait, so you won't really need to start until after dark tonight. I believe I'd rather start now, though, and go at less speed, suggested Jack thoughtfully. That's just as you please, of course, not as a shipbuilder. I will take us out in the water for one thing, Captain Jack continued, and we've been growing stale on shore of late. Then he added whimsically, besides, if the agents of any more foreign government show up, they won't find us here. And there's a Jap just about due now, grimaced Epp. Take Williamson with you for use in the engine room, advised Mr. Farnham. That will allow you to take the boat through the two watches above and below. Which boat will you take? The Spitfire, unless you'd rather have us take the other one, young Benson replied. Take the Spitfire, by all means, nodded the owner. Twenty minutes later, Williamson having been found, the crew was all ready for the start for Craven's Bay. Epp and Williamson cast off from the mornings, while Hal Hastings, down below at the gasoline motors, started the twin propellers as soon as Jack Benson at the deck wheel signaled for speed ahead. Right after the start, Williamson, a grown man and machinist, dropped below. Epp Summers stood beside the young submarine captain. For some minutes, both boys gazed out over the waters, and Epp remarked, Well, we got away without being overhauled by a Jap or a Russian, didn't we? I don't know, smiled Jack unsuspectingly. See that launch over there to port? Hang if she doesn't seem to be putting toward us. She does, admitted up solemnly. Oh, well, with a few more turns of the screw, we can easily get away from that launch. For some moments, Captain Jack paid no especial heed to the launch bearing down upon them on the port side. Not only at a distance that the launch contained two men, Presently, however, as the launch came nearer, Captain Benson made a discovery. Epp, he gasped, look over there. Are my eyes going back on me, or is that a Japanese in the bow of the launch? Japanese, gasped Epp Summers in turn. Nothing but. Epp made a swift dive for the box that contained the signal flag used in International Marine Signaling Code. Moving swiftly, young Summers selected the two flags representing N and D. Then he strung to the haller of the short signal mast forward. Nor was he ahead of time, for by the time the launch had described part of a circle and was coming up alongside. In the bow of the launch stood the Japanese, smiling and holding a megaphone in his hand. Submarine ahoy! came the hell. Will you slow down? I have something to say to you. Up flew the signals, fluttering in the breeze, and Epp snatched up a megaphone holding the smaller end to his mouth. Launch ahoy, he shouted back. Just tell your folks that you saw our signal. The Japanese read the fluttering flags and then called back. N.D., what does that mean? Hoarsely, Epp Summers bellowed back. Nothing doing. End of Chapter 2 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter Three of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter Three: The Man Who Marked Charts. It was a little before midnight when the Spitfire came to anchor in Craven's Bay. After having been piloted to anchorage by a quartermaster's tug that put off from Fort Craven on signal, 
Fine place if your searchlight is keen enough, yawned Epp, gazing off into the darkness. Epp and Williamson's had slept through the evening after supper, and were now to take the night watch, the machinist's deck watch beginning at once and lasting until four in the morning. About an hour after daylight, Epp Summers deserted the deck, except for occasional intervals. After a while, the odor of coffee and steak was in the air. Then, snatching up a bugle, Summers sounded the reveille tumultuously through the small cabin of the submarine torpedo boat. Not long did the other members of the crew take to turn out and dress. They came out into the cabin to find Epp trotting between table and galley, putting things on the table. This seems like old times, chuckled Williamson as he seated himself with the boys. Yeah, because you don't have to cook, grumbled Epp. Wait until after breakfast when you have to clear away and wash dishes. Even so, I've had the best of it, laughed the machinist good humoredly. I have something in my stomach to work on. I always do get the tough end of any job, don't I? grumbled Epp resigningly, then buried his troubles under a plate full of steak and fried potatoes. You hoisted the signal N.D. yesterday afternoon, laughed Captain Jack, laying down his cup of coffee. If you don't watch out, Epp, I'll hoist the N.G. flag over the stable. Breakfast no good, demanded Epp, looking much offended. No N.G. will stand for no grouch. Summers joined heartily in the laughter that followed. Just as they were finishing a really good meal for which every breakfaster had a royal salt-water appetite, a steamer's whistle was heard not far off to port. I'll bet that's the army tug, muttered Captain Jack, rising hastily from the table. Tell you what, fellows, we got to begin to have something like navy discipline around this craft. In that case, we'd have had breakfast over an hour ago. Jack was off up the stairs, as though pursued. Epp went after him as soon as that youth with the sun-kissed hair had time to pull on his visored cap and button his blouse. No matter what the need of haste, Summers never appeared on the deck looking less natty than a veteran naval officer. Forward on the tug stood a major of engineers, a young lieutenant beside him. "'Good morning, Mr. Benson,' hailed Major Woodruff. "'We're going to try to come in close enough to put a gangplank over. Can you take a bow line from us?' "'Yes, sir,' Captain Jack saluted the Army officer, and Epp hurried to receive the line." In less than two minutes, Major Woodruff and Lieutenant Klein were on the platform deck of the Spitfire. This is the first one of your crafts we've seen, declared the Major, and Epp cast off the bow line and the tug back water. Will you show us over? This the submarine boys gladly did, and the Army shares with the Navy in the defense of this country. You see what you have to do, Klein, said Major Woodruff presently. Then the older officer turned to Jack to say, Mr. Benson, since Mr. Farnham has been kind enough to place you in the boat at our orders, Klein is going to remain on board today during the tests. It will give Mr. Summers whatever orders are necessary in order to make the tests more successful. Why not give the orders to me, sir, said Jack. What you see, Mr. Benson, replied the Major, I plan for you to be on shore out on the neck to make certain observations regarding the work of your craft. Those observations you will turn into me. Very good, sir. The neck, I take it, is the narrow strip of land that separates this part of the bay from the ocean. Quite right, Mr. Benson. It was to be observed that the Major, like naval officers, addressed Jack by the title of Mr., not Captain. This was because, in the military service, Army and Navy titles are not recognized unless conferred by government appointment or commission. Hence, though young Benson was captain to his crew and to his civilians, officers of the United States could address him only as Mr. The neck, Mr. Benson, continued Major Woodruff, is the land best suited for watching our work from today and now. I will state what the object of today's test is. This morning our tug will be engaged in planting certain submarine mines. Mr. Summers, Mr. Summers will watch our work of planting, of course, the mines will contain no explosive. You young men have, I understand, solved the problem of leaving the submarine boat while it lies on the bottom. You are also able to enter the submarine again from the surface. Quite right, Major, Jack nodded. 
Then if Mr. Summers watches the planting of the dummy mines, he will have the same advantage as would the commander of an enemy submarine knowing where our mines are planted. We shall plant four of them this morning, and Mr. Summers, after seeing each mine planted, will mark down its position on the chart of the bay. He will then take the boat outside, enter under water, and, without touching any of our mines while handling the boat, we'll see if he can stop close by and cut the connecting wires. If your mines contain no explosive, Major, Epp inquired, how are you going to be able to tell whether I collided gently with one of your submarine mines? We should know at once, smiled Major Woodruff. If you should collide with one, you will cause a bell to be rung in the camera obscura room over at the fort. The bell that rings will show us which one of the mines you touched against. The camera obscura, as used at a modern fort, is in itself a most interesting contrivance. While no elaborate description of it can be attempted here, it will be enough to explain to the reader that in the camera room, which is darkened, is a large white table covered with white oil cloth or other white substance. On this white surface is drawn a plan of the harbor to be defended. The position of each mine sunk under the water surface is indicated on the map against the white background. Each mine is numbered. Overhead is a revolving shutter, somewhat on the plan of a camera's lens shutter. This shutter, which turns a reflecting lens on the harbor, can be turned in any direction. Any vessel in the harbor can be thus caught and its reflection in miniature thrown upon the white surface. Suppose an enemy's battleship to be entering the harbor. The camera obscura shutter, and being turned about, suddenly throws upon the white screen map the miniature picture of the hostile battleship. Henceforth, the officer in command sees to it that the shutter is so operated as to keep the image of the battleship always upon the white screen. Thus the course of the battleship is followed. Absolutely. At any second, the exact position of that battleship in the harbor is known. Let us suppose that the officer in command at the white map covered table finds that the battleship is gradually approaching the position indicated in the harbor as mine number 19. As the officer watches the moving image of the battleship, he sees it going closer and closer to the exact spot number 19 on the white map. Be ready, Sergeant, calls the officer, warningly, to a non-commissioned officer who stands before a ward on the wall in which are several electric push buttons, each numbered. Yes, sir, replies the sergeant. At this moment, the officer sees the image of the battleship passing fairly over the dot on the white map that is number 19. Fire 19, sergeant, calls the army officer in charge. The non-commissioned officer quickly presses electric button number 19. As he does so, the electric current is sent flashing, perhaps along four or five miles of insulated wire on the bottom of the harbor. At the other end of that wire is submarine mine number 19. In a breathless instant, the current travels the whole length of the wire. The spark has reached the gun cotton. There is a dull, booming sound. A great column of water shoots up from the surface. In the midst of the commotion, the enemy's battleship is rent, and all on board, perhaps killed. The cool, dry-eyed army officer bending over the white screen map sees all this scene on a horror depicted under the white surface beneath his eyes. He knows that submarine mine number 19, planted out there in the harbor, has done its duty in protecting this portion of the coast of the United States. Here at Fort Craven, it was desired to find whether an enemy submarine boat could creep in, below the surface, find the mine whose location was already known through spies and effectively cutting the fire wire, if this could be done, then in wartime, it might be that the sergeant at the wall board would press the button in vain. No explosion would follow, with the current thus cut off. The officer bending over the white screen would not see the miniature reproduction of the destruction of the enemy's battleship. A submarine torpedo boat coming into a harbor underneath the surface is not pictured on the white table under the camera obscura. So it was desired to see whether Epp could come in, knowing the exact locations of each of the four dummy mines, 
and quickly cut the firing electric wires. If this could be done, the Army would have to revise its method of firing such submarine mines by means of the camera obscure detection. As Epp listened to the explanation, his mind began to revolve plans rapidly where he hoped succeeded in cutting the mines. He will keep sufficiently below the surface, too, Mr. Summers, continued Major Woodruff. We don't want you so close to the surface of the water that a rebel could show on the camera obscure table. You cannot, of course, rise and use your periscope to see where you are. Even the periscope would betray you. The periscope is a device also of the nature of a camera obscura. In the case of the periscope, a narrow metallic tube is thrusted above the water and the shutter turned about, reflecting all the scene about on a white covered table in the boat's cabin. I think I can beat you, Major smiled up. I certainly hope you can, replied Major Woodruff. That is exactly what we want to see today. You should watch closely, too, and see whether any plan can be devised for beating a submarine torpedo boat at its own game. Lieutenant Klein was to remain on board the Spitfire, both in order to watch the work and to give Epp any instructions that might be necessary in order to make the test more conclusive. If you come along with me, then, Mr. Benson, suggested Major Woodruff, I'll put you ashore on the neck, and on the way over I'll give you your instructions. As the tug came alongside again, Jack followed the Major over the gangplank to the deck of the other craft. Goodbye, Captain Summers, called Jack, laughingly. Give a fine account of yourself as an enemy of the United States. Oh, you, began Epp, flaring right, but wisely cutting his speech short. On the way over to the strip of land known as the Neck, Major Woodruff managed to make his instructions wholly clear to young Benson. Now you know what to watch for and what observations to report to me, finished the Major of Engineers. As the tug came to a stop, a small boat was lowered, and in this Captain Jack Benson was put on the desolate shore. Then the tug went back over by the fort. Jack grew tired of waiting for it was some two hours. The tug finally left the ordnance wharf at Fort Craven. It was warm out there on the low, sandy cliffs, provided one got into a position sheltered from the ocean winds. So Jack, in the weariness of his waiting, threw himself down in a sheltered hollow. Finding that the sun shone disagreeably in his eyes, the submarine boy pulled his cap forward over his face. Then, in the course of a very few minutes, the inevitable happened. Jack Benson drifted off to sleep. He awoke with a fearful start, for he had no idea how long he had slept. Yanking out his watch and noting the time, the submarine boy concluded that he had not been asleep for more than twenty or thirty minutes. But I might just as easily have slept for hours, Benson reproached himself. Then, what a hero I'd have felt asleep on the post. At that moment, Jack Benson heard a faraway whistle. Across the bay, showing just the top of his head above the ridge of sand, Captain Jack saw the army tug just pulling out from the dock across the bay. But Jack saw something else, too, in that brief instant. A slim, soldierly-looking man of perhaps thirty, tall and of naturally good carriage, was sculling along the front of the submarine boy, yet hidden from the bay, under one arm, the stranger carried a draftsman's board and a book. Strapped over one shoulder held a field glass case. Where in blazes have I seen that chap before? wondered Captain Jack Benson, staring hard. For I've seen him somewhere, as I declare that under oath. Figure, carnage, and face all strangely haunted the submarine boy, who crouched lower, watching. By the great tarragon, he's skulking for a reason, muttered Benson. Is he spying on the mine planting? I wonder, yes, that must be his work. Long legs, I'll keep my eye on you. The stranger hastened along for perhaps a quarter of a mile further. Then he threw himself down on the sand, choosing a position which he could lie flat, his head fairly well hidden behind a low ridge of sand. Unslinging the field glass case, the stranger brought it to his eyes, closely watching the progress of the tug. 
The minutes passed, though Jack Benson was so absorbed in watching this long stranger that the boy had but the vaguest notions of the flight of the time. The tug had halted. Now a great crane at the bow swung round, and the submarine mind hung poised in the air. Then, with a rattle of chains not audible at the distance, the mine was slowly lowered until it touched the bottom. While this was going on, the long-legged stranger, wholly absorbed in his work, made some observations and hurried calculations. Then he pulled the drawing board toward him, jotting down a point. Jack Benson, standing stealthily, got a good look for the first time at the top of that drawing board. A chart of the bay, of course, muttered Benson savagely between his teeth. The feller is marking down the exact positions of that mine. Still, the submarine boy did nothing to betray his own presence. He watched and wondered. The thought struck him that this long-legged one might be an officer of the army on observation duty like the submarine boy himself. Uh, but that isn't right. I'm sure it isn't, decided young Benson quickly. If they fellow were here on honest business, he wouldn't have sneaked out here to get a position. Besides, I have a vague remembrance of this fellow, and I don't connect with him anything that's honest. The army tug out in the bay was now engaged in planting a second mind. Again, the slim stranger was all attention. When the crane began to lower the mine, a second mark was made on the chart of the drawing board. Now once... The fellow lay at full length watching intently over the bay. At his right hand lay drawing board, the book, and the field glasses. I'll give him a little excitement, grimaced Jack Benson, stealing softly forward. Suddenly, the boy swooped down upon the drawing board, book, and glasses. Then, with a panting whoop, wheeled and started off in a dead run. Here you stop, yelled the slim one, hoarse with a sudden anger. Like a flash. The stranger was up and in pursuit. As he quickened in the chase, the stranger drew a revolver that glinted in the sun. End of chapter 3 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 4 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 4 Jack's Queer Lot of Loot. Stop, thief! Jack Benson only sped onward faster. Halt, you young rascal, roared the long-legged one in pursuit. The fellow who can call names like that under the circumstances has no sense of humor, chuckled the submarine boy inwardly. Drop that chart and book, panted the one in chase. You're stealing government property. Yes, but what government? Jack shot back at his pursuer. Are you going to stop? Jack's answer was to increase his burst of speed slightly. Then I'm going to fire, came the warning, glancing over his shoulder. The submarine boy saw the long-legged one still running after him. At the same time, the pursuer was raising his revolver, sighting. Jack felt a little shiver. He had never been suspected of being a coward, yet he was willing to admit that he didn't want to feel a chunk of lead plowing its way through him. Last word to halt, yelled the pursuer in an ugly tone. Fire, then, dared Jack Benson. Crack, whiz, the weapon was discharged promptly. Jack, still in flight, heard the bullet whistle by him. Then it struck the sand fifty feet ahead, throwing up a spurt of fine particles. That was for a caution. The next shot will be to hit, panted the pursuer. I wonder if you can do it, Jack taunted backward over his shoulder. There was method in the submarine boy's tactics. He hoped, by making the stranger angry, to spoil his aim. Crack! The bullet sped by, fanning the fugitive's face. Close aim, however, had the reverse of the effect expected by the marksman. It roused all the submarine boy's anger. He might be hit, but he would stop now only if a bullet laid him low. Two more shots sped after the fugitive. Their aim was too close for comfort, though not true enough to score a hit. 
Each of the shots sounded a bit further back, too. He's getting winded, gritted the running submarine boy. With his long legs, that chap ought to get over your ground faster than I. The difference is that fellow is out of condition, and my hard work keeps me about to the mark of condition all the time. Crack! Jack happened to turn just as the fellow fired, and the boy was able to see that the bullet struck the ground behind him. Out of range, clicked Benson. What's the good of carrying a pocket revolver for service work? Now, if he had a dozen shots more left, he would be wasting his cartridges to fire at me. In fact, it was plain enough that the pursuer had given up the chase for the time being. Not only was he out of range of his quarry, but the long-legged one lacked the wind to keep on in foot. Say, what a fool I've been to give up this plunder, cried Jack mockingly. That chap couldn't catch me, he couldn't hit me, so I've gotten away with the stuff he was so anxious to have, and which the army, I'll bet, would a thousand times rather he didn't have. Now, how am I going to get back to the army, people? wondered young Benson. Slowing down to a walk, though keeping a vigilant lookout to the rear, I didn't want to walk something like a million miles to find a place for which I could get across the bay. It was desolate country over here. Jack and the long-legged one, well to his rear, now might be the only human beings within some miles. The outlook was not an encouraging one. Say, wow, whoop blazes, uttered Captain Jack suddenly. Now I remember long legs. Millard was his name. He gave it when he came to us at Dunhaven last fall. He was a chap who wanted to work on the submarine construction. Said he'd do any kind of work, but Grant Andrews put him in a separate shed, sorting and counting steel rivets, and never let him get near a submarine boat. That's the same fellow Mallard, or at least that was his name, he gave us. But when Mallard found he wasn't going to do anything but take care of rivets, he threw up the job four days after. He had pretended to be mighty hard up, too, and wanted to work at any sort of wages. Jack's face began to glow as he remembered more and more of the brief career of Millard at Dunhaven. And David Pollard, when he was over in Washington later, said he ran across Millard living at the swell Arlington Hotel. Millard had a different name in Washington and refused to recognize Mr. Pollard. Said there was some mistake by Hooky. There isn't any mistake Millard was trying to steal submarine secrets at Dunhaven. And now he's trying to map out harbor defenses in Craven Bay. Again, Captain Jack glanced backward over his shoulder. But Millard was no longer in sight. He knew me probably in a flash, muttered the submarine boy. I'm sorry I didn't recognize him sooner. Having gotten his wind back, Jack broke into a run again. Just because Millard had dropped out of sight was no reason for taking chances of a sudden swoop from the stranger. For some five minutes, Jack Benson jogged along. Then he came in sight of a little semi-cove. Here lay a small motor launch whose skipper, somewhat of a fisherman type, was busily engaged with the engine. Say, hail, running down to the water's edge. Can you start your engine at once? I reckon not of the fisherman looking up. Run your bow in so I can get aboard. Then, directed Captain Jack briskly, I want to get over to where the Army Tug is at work. Do you know where it is, over in the southeast ward? Yes, nodded the fisherman. I'll give you three dollars to take me over there in a hustle, proposed Jack. You're easy enough, grinned the man in the boat, starting the engine, then lightly driving the bow of the boat upon the sand. But you'll pay me in advance. Certainly, nodded the submarine boy, taking out the money, as he stepped into the boat and handing it over. Now pick up that boat hook and shove off and we'll start, added the master of the little launch. As Jack snatched up the boat hook, he caught sight of Millard, three hundred yards away, just coming in sight on a run. You better get your engine going fast, warned Jack, or that fellow headed this way will make trouble for both of us. He's carrying a gun. The skipper took just one look at Millard, who was racing along, pistol in hand, and was prepared to believe his present passenger. That little launch stole out of the cove under its reverse gear until the master of the craft thought himself far enough from shore for him to be out of range of Miller's weapon. Who is that fellow? asked the fisherman. 
when satisfied that he was at a safe distance and increasing it every instant. From the way he's dancing up and down, it looks as though if he were crazy, laughed Jack coolly. What's his particular specialty in craziness? asked the master of the launch, looking shrewdly at the submarine boy. Now see here, protested Benson, good humoredly. As I understand it, you're paid to take me over to the Army Tug, not to ask questions, am I right? You're right, nodded the fisherman, and surveyed the boy's uniform curiously. Your uniform looks like you was in the Navy, suggested the man at the stern of the boat. Does it? queried Jack. Are you in the Navy? persisted the boatman. Just now I'm serving with the Army, Captain Jack replied evasively. Are you? started in the human interrogation point anew. See here, broke in the submarine boy. I thought we agreed you had just one job to do for me, and that questions formed no part of it. Oh, that's right, agreed the fisherman. But say, there's just one question I wish you'd answer me. Are you? No, interrupted Benson decisively. I am not. I never was. You didn't let me finish, complained the man. Wait until I'm out of the boat, proposed the submarine boy. Then ask all the questions you like. Maybe you're paid to ask questions, but I'm paid to hold my mouth shut. It went a good deal against the submarine boy's grain to be so brisk with an inquisitive stranger, but there seemed to be no other defense. Oh, well, if you're ashamed of your business, retorted the fisherman, falling into a sudden silence. This turn of affairs just suited Benson. He compressed his lips and sat back looking out across the bay at the tug, which is at work some three miles away. "'Can you put a little more speed?' inquired Jack. "'No,' answered the fisherman sulkily. "'Doing all the gates she can kick now.' So Jack possessed his soul in patience until the whizzy little launch had covered the whole distance. While still some two hundred yards off, Jack caught sight of Major Woodruff coming out of the aft cabin of the tug. Ahoy, Major, yelled the submarine boy, holding his hands to his lips. Perhaps you better stop work until I've reported. Then the launch ran alongside, and Jack stepped up to the deck of the tug, holding tightly to the loot he had taken from Millard. The master of the launch manifested a disposition to hang about in the near vicinity, until curtly ordered away by Major Woodruff. I suppose you thought, Major, that I took a good deal upon myself in advising you to suspend work, Jack hinted. Yet I've something to show you and much to tell, and I'm wagering an anchor to a fish hook that you'll be glad you stationed me over on that neck of sand. Major Woodruff led the way back into his cabin. There he examined the chart with a start of astonishment. The fellow is marking down all our mines' positions, came savagely from between the army officer's teeth. Then he picked up the book. A nice little assortment of notes of matters of military interest along the coast, muttered the soldier. Your long-legged fellow has been busy at other points than Craven's Bay. Then closing the book with a snap, Major Woodruff looked keenly at the submarine boy as he remarked, Mr. Benson, I think our present submarine test can be well suspended. We have a much more important task ahead of us, to catch this impudent thief of military cigarettes. And in this undertaking, Benson, you can be of the greatest sort of help. End of chapter 4 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 5 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham Chapter 5 Sighting the Enemy You can count on me, sir, declared Captain Jack Benson eagerly. I can count on every one of you submarine boys, can't I? asked Major Woodruff thoughtfully. You can count on us, declared Benson, as though every one of us were sworn into the service and had a record of being tried and tested. In an instant after speaking, the submarine boy realized that he must have had a boastful sound, so he added quickly, Please don't suspect me, Major, of being a, a braggart. 
but hal Epp, and i have always taken our work with seriousness we have always acted just as though the flag depended upon us for its protection we have the desire every minute of our lives to be great americans that is great in our devotion to the flag even if we can't be great in deeds by jove i believe you cried major woodruff reaching forward and clasping jack's hand tightly in his own the major went on heartily no no benson i don't consider you boastful you're talking the way i heard some youngsters talk when i was a boy it's refreshing and encouraging to hear you talk that way do you know boy when we older fellows sometimes get to thinking of the country's past glories we wonder whether the boys of today are going to make such men as have carried the united states of america forward in the past the thought makes us solemn and anxious i suppose every man who has grown and on toward middle life has always in every generation wondered whether boys were as serious and dependable as staunch and loyal as the boys of the day before yesterday look here lad major woodruff rose stepping to the door aft and throwing it open the stern of the tug was visible from the pole that slanted out over the stern hung the stars and stripes you don't need to glance at that fine old bit of bunting more than a second lad continued the major before you feel all that it can ever make you feel in your case i believe the sight of the flag is always an inspiration to you i pray it is so with every boy who grows up in this country standing there before the flag jack quietly doffed his cap thank you benson acknowledging the major also doffing his cap then closing the door Major Woodruff stepped back to the table on which lay the charted book. This chart, Benson, shows what that rascal Millard had been doing out on the neck. The book proves that he has been at work at some other points. The book doesn't tell much of a story, though. Of that I am certain. Millard, if he has been at work long, has compiled other notes and other written volumes. If so, then he has also made other charts of our coast defenses. But what other government has he thus marked a series of charts with our secrets? And has Millard succeeded in getting other charts and other books of notes off to the foreign government he is serving? Or has he them hidden somewhere in this country, awaiting his chances to take the result of his spying out of the United States? Oh, I wish I knew, muttered Jack. I'm coming to the point, continued Major Woodruff briskly. Now, of course, when we discover evidence that spies of another government are at work along our lines of national defense, the first thing we try to do is catch these foreign agents and all the material they have succeeded in getting together. Major Woodruff, who is becoming considerably excited, paused to light a cigar, ere he continued more slowly. Now you and your two friends, Benson, know this fellow Millard. You will spot him instantly wherever you go. I shall communicate with Washington at once, by means of a telegram in the cipher. The War Department will order me to use all speed in catching Millard, and find out where he keeps his other stolen records. Men and money will be used in running down this fellow. Yet you and your two chums should be in the front ranks of pursuit, for you will know him the instant you lay eyes on him. You want me to take my friends ashore, then, Major, and lay up the Spitfire? By no means, answered Major Woodruff decisively. In reality, operations will be suspended at this point until we have a run Miller down. Yet we must have the appearance of being as busy as ever. The submarine will hover about, and this tug will be busy, apparently, in laying the bay with mines. You have a fourth man on your boat. Yes, sir. Williamson, the machinist. Can he run the engines all right? As well as any of us, Major. And I will put him aboard a man who can steer. Thus the Spitfire will be seen moving about the bay and apparently at work. I also put aboard a guard of a sergeant and three or four soldiers from the engineer corps. And they'll guard that boat from harm with their lives. That will leave all three of you young officers of the Spitfire free for shore duty it will major and now sir what is that shore duty to be simply to locate millard 
He may be at one of the hotels in Radford. Radford was a busy, important little port four miles further up the bay. He likes to be somewhere in Radford anyway, nodded young Benson. Well, whatever the fellow has found, he must be seized at once, continued Major Woodruff. Any policeman will seize him on your request. I will give each of you three a written statement that you have been asked to locate Millard and have him arrested. If you run across Millard anywhere, turn him over to a policeman, then show my written authorization. On that, the police authorities will hold the scoundrel and notify the military authorities. Then, once we have Millard out at Fort Craven, securely under lock and key, by authority from Washington, we will make every effort under the sun to locate his charts and notebooks. Why, the work you want us to do is going to be easy enough, murmured Captain Jack. It is going to be easy if you succeed in finding the fellow and in turning him over to a policeman, replied Major Wilberduff. And by the way, I've just remembered that Lieutenant Ritter of the Engineer Corps reported last night from a former station in the West. No one around here will know him. Good enough. I'll have Ritter get into citizen's clothes and go about with you three. He can give you instructions on any point about which you're in doubt. We ought to run that rascal down, sir, answered Jack Benson. Unless... Unless what, Benson? Why, sir, unless he's more clever than a rascal, usually succeeds in being. I haven't lived so very long, Major Woodruff, but from what little I've seen of the world, it has struck me that the cleverest scoundrels are always just a little less smart in the end than the average of honest men. I hope you'll prove it in this case, replied the Major. And now, to signal your boat, we'll run both craft in at the ordnance dock at Fort Craven. A couple of miles away, Epp Summers was slowly running the submarine back and forth over the water in seeming aimlessness. In response to sharp blasts from the whistle of the Army tug, the Spitfire was seen to turn and head for the tug. Mr. Summers, you will follow in our wake, shouted Major Woodruff. When the two craft were within hauling distance of each other, we will show you where to make fast at the ordnance dock. Very good, sir, Epp responded with a salute. A little later in the forenoon, both boats docked at the waterfront of Fort Craven. He'll come up to my quarters now and meet Lieutenant Ritter, announced the Major. When he had gathered the submarine boys together, and when Jack had given necessary explanations to Williamson. You mean not see us again for a few days, Jack informed the machinist. Ah, that won't surprise me so very much either, laughed the machinist. Things are always happening. Where you are and mysteries have ceased to puzzle me. Have you young men ever been on a military post before? inquired Major Woodruff as he led them up from the dock. Never, sir, replied Jack. We have seen considerable of Navy life, but this is the first time we've ever been at a fort. You don't see much about this place, do you? laughed the engineering officer. That makes you think of a fort. Not much, Benson admitted. Yet yeah, we have a fighting plant here that could prevent a big fleet indeed from getting far up the bay at the important cities beyond. That is, Woodruff continued, thoughtfully in a low voice. If the enemy, in advance of his coming here, doesn't know all about our defenses through the work of the spies. Just at that point near the dock, Fort Craven looked not unlike the yard of a big factory plant. Wagons going and coming constantly heightened this effect. Beyond, past the plain on one side, Major Woodruff pointed out the barracks of the coast artillery of the engineer soldiers and of the infantry. There were also laborers' quarters, several office buildings, a hospital, a chapel, and two streets of cottages that served as quarters for the officers stationed at the Fort Craven. It was one of those officer streets that Major Woodruff soon led his three young companions admitting the boys to his home. The Major took them to the library on the ground floor. Now I'll telephone for Lieutenant Ritter to come over in citizen's dress. At the same time, I must advise Colonel Totten, who is commander of the post. He may come over here, or he may order us all over to headquarters. Curtin Totten elected to come over to the major's quarters. He arrived just after Lieutenant Ritter, who proved to be a rather boyish-looking young man, not long out of West Point. 
The plans were quickly laid by which Lieutenant Ritter was to take an automobile up to Radford, going to one of the hotels and registering. Jack and his two chums were to make the journey in another auto. They would go to still another hotel, perhaps to three different ones. At any moment when instructions were needed, any one of the three could call up Lieutenant Ritter on the telephone. In addition, Major Woodruff gave each of them three submarine boys a written and signed authorization for them to call upon the police to seize Millard, if found, and hold the fellow for the United States military authorities. Now you young men may start for Radford, continued the Major. Colonel Totten and I will busy ourselves with the dispatches that must be sent to Washington about this affair, but I trust you lads will not fail to realize the importance of prompt success. It's special duty to the flag, sir, Captain Jack answered simply. The automobiles were waiting outside. Lieutenant Ritter was given a three-minute start. Then the submarine boys followed after in the second car. As Radford was but four miles distance from the post, the trip was not to be a long one. This is a sort of job that has me by the ears, glowed up Summers enthusiastically. I won't be selfish enough to say I hope to be the fellow to catch Millard. But if he does stray my way, I hope I won't be an idiot enough to let him slip through my fingers. I don't care if Lieutenant Ritter is the only one who nabs him, remarked Hal coolly. All that I'm particularly about is to see the foreign agent nab before he succeeds in getting any more information out of the country. The car that bore the boys was soon driving through the streets of Radford. Jack held in his hand a list of better grade and middle class hotels that Colonel Totten had given him. Which hotels are we going to first? asked Hal. I don't know, uttered Jack suddenly, sharply. I know what I'm going to do, however. Leaning forward, the young submarine captain prodded the chauffeur lightly, twice in the back, a signal that had been agreed upon at need. In response, the chauffeur ran the car slowly in at the curb. Captain Jack, opening the two-no door, was quickly out on the sidewalk without any need having risen from wholly stopping the car, which then shot forward again. Now what on earth was that for? demanded Epp Summers as the car sped on. Don't look back, replied Hal. Why not? Well, a certain party would see you looking at him. Ooh! Why, Jack had the good luck to see Millard going along on the sidewalk. We just passed the fellow. Are we going to nab him? demanded Summers breathlessly. You'll have to leave that decision to good old Jack, chuckled Hal. He's out there, dodging Millard from the rear. It's Jack Benson affair just at this moment. It was mighty hard for Epp to refrain from looking back, but he restrained his curiosity. End of chapter 5 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 6 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Flank Movement and Rear Attack. When Jack Benson first touched the sidewalk and the automobile glided on, leaving him in the wake of Millard, it was the young submarine captain's intention to follow his instructions to the letter. Millard, having no special reason of his own for feeling in danger, was walking along at a moderate gait, occasionally glancing into shop windows or gazing at the people whom he passed. He did not look behind, so it was easy for Jack, less than half a block to the rear, and keeping close to the buildings, to follow him without being detected. Hello, muttered the submarine boy. There's a policeman on the crossing at the next corner. In another moment, our long-legged one will be safely in custody. Feeling in his inner coat pocket for the written authorization, Benson's fingers touched the envelope. He's easily caught, murmured the boy. There is sometimes a big slip between a wish and its fulfillment. Just as Captain Jack was on the point of darting out into the street 
to hail the policeman, a streetcar whizzed by. With a flying leap, the policeman landed on the front platform and was whirled along the thoroughfare. Lesson one about being too sure, grumbled disappointed young Benson. However, we'll soon come upon another policeman. Two blocks more were covered, however, without sighting a blue coat. Jack even began to wonder how it would do to leap upon Millard, calling upon passing citizens to aid him until a policeman arrived. But that would be a two-edged sword that might cut too keenly on the wrong side, reflected the submarine boy. Millard would be sure to claim that I was assaulting him. It would look like that, too and I'd probably get a thumping from the crowd while Millard slipped away. Then he would be warned that he was wanted, and he'd make himself mighty scarce after that. Still no policeman came into sight. Gracious, muttered Jack Benson suddenly. He had just glanced into a store's show window, where a mirror was set at an angle. The submarine boy, looking into that mirror, became aware that he could see people at a considerable distance behind him down the street. I wonder if Millard has been taking sights, too, and has had a peep at me that way, muttered the boy. At the next corner, the long-legged one, after a brief look down the side street, turned into it. Now that we're getting away from the main street, there'll be far less chance of finding a police officer, sighed Jack at last wholly discontented with luck. Millard led without, apparently, ever thinking to glance back. He turned a second corner into another small street and kept on. This is getting more exciting, muttered the young trailer, yet all signs point to the fact that I've got to make the grab all by myself. I wonder if I can down that chap and get the upper hand of him. I don't mind a thumping, but I'd be sadly ashamed of myself to let the fellow get away from me. Millard was walking briskly now. Next he turned sharply to the left. Ah! Then Jack Benson shot swiftly forward on tiptoe, trying to make no noise as he ran. For the long-legged one had, to all seeming, at the distance, wheeled and gone through the wall of a brick building. Just an instant later, however, this impossible feat was explained. The submarine boy found himself at the street end of a narrow alley between two brick buildings. He has gone into the rear house at the end of the alleyway, decided Benson, peering down this narrow thoroughfare. He has left the door partly open, too. I'll have to have a look in. As he stole down the alleyway, Jack Benson was too sensible and by this time too much experienced in the ways of a rougher world, not to suspect that there might be some trap in that door partly open. He may have seen me, and may have left that door open on purpose, Benson reflected. He may be lying in wait for me inside, or else he may have left the door open just to make me suspect a trap and keep out. In the meantime, he may be slipping through a door on the other side of the house, and sneaking away from me. For a few seconds Jack Benson paused thoughtfully on the step just outside the door that was partly ajar. I may walk into a trap by going inside, or I may be letting that wretch walk out of one by staying out here, wavered Benson, torn between two impulses. Then just as suddenly this thought flashed through his mind. What you're doing is for the flag. Never mind what happens to you, Jack Benson. Just rush in and say, here goes. There was not another second's hesitation. Jack Benson softly pushed the door far enough open to admit him. At the back of the hallway, he saw stairs leading below. Basement stairs, with a rear basement door letting out on another alleyway, suspected the submarine boy. Though he had determined to be as reckless as seemed necessary in order to get quickly on the trail of the vanished one, Jack moved on tiptoe. He had all but reached the head of the stairs when a ground-floor door behind him opened noiselessly. The long-legged one, who had an equally good reach of arm, thrust out a noose that fell over the boy's head. Ugh! rattled in Jack Benson's throat 
as Millard, in grim silence, jerked the rope noose tight about the boy's neck. A sharp pull, a twist, and Millard had the boy face down in that hallway and was kneeling on the victim's back. "'You ought to have known enough to keep away from me,' growled the wretch as he tightened on the noose. That was about the last that the young submarine captain heard or knew just then, for things were rapidly growing black before his eyes. Jack tried to fight, but the choking was too severe. He couldn't get even a breath of air into his lungs to give him fighting strength. Finding that the boy's struggles had ceased, the long-legged one eased off on the noose. He bent Jack's arms behind him so that the wrists crossed. Then, pulling another cord from one of his pockets, the wretch tied the youngster's hands with a few deft movements. Oh, but this rascal was an expert artist with ropes and cords. Jack felt himself being prodded just over the pit of the stomach, and his senses slowly wandered back to him under the disturbing handling. He was lying on his back when his eyes opened once more. His throat felt sore, but he could breathe again. Then the submarine boy discovered that his hands and feet were securely lashed. Beyond that he discovered Millard squatting on the floor close by, in Japanese fashion, for the foreign agent was sitting back on his own crossed heels. "'Feel wholly comfortable?' mockingly inquired the foreign agent when he saw the boy's eyes open. "'Not especially, thank you,' mumbled the boy dryly. Jack had discovered by this time that he was lying on a wooden floor, very likely in the basement of the house. The room contained no furniture beyond an old table. Daylight was excluded by wooden shutters fastened into place over the windows. On the table a single candle burned in a candlestick. "'Why didn't you bring along with you, Benson?' sneered the long fellow. "'The property of mine that you stole from me.' It was plain, then, that the foreign agent remembered the submarine boy well. Why are you playing this fool trick on me? counter-questioned Captain Jack. You knew I didn't have the, the things with me. You could see that. I put you to this inconvenience, replied the foreign agent, because I wanted to know a few things. In the first place, why are you bothering with me or with my plans? Jack remained silent. Won't talk, eh? Oh, well, then, perhaps we can find out a few things without any very special help from you. Millard bent over, thrusting his hand into one after another of young Benson's pockets. In so doing, he brought to light the envelope in the lad's inner coat pocket. Just an instant later, the wretch snatched the folded sheet from the envelope, spread the paper open, and held it up to the light. Ho, ho, sneered the rascal. An order authorizing you to cause my arrest? This disposes of your case, then, young Mr. Benson. End of Flank Movement and Rear Attack Chapter 7 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. A Lesson in Security and Information. Despite the savageness of his utterance, Millard continued to gaze thoughtfully for a few moments at the submarine boy's face. As the rascal gazed, however, a grayness came into his cheeks that, somehow, smote Captain Jack with secret terror. I, I don't see how it can be helped, gasped Millard, at last, in an altered tone that came as another dash of ice water over the submarine boy. Benson, I hate to do it. I'd hate to use a dog in such a way, but, but there's no help for it. A long drawn out sigh, still queerer look in his face then the scoundrel broke forth again it's your own fault after all boy and there's no help for it by and by i suppose you'll enlighten me as to what it means hinted jack 
trying hard to bolster up a courage that, none the less, would ooze and drop. Millard's only answer was to bend over the boy and roll him somewhat in examining the prisoner's bonds. It was through this that Jack discovered what he had not known before, namely, that his wrists, besides being bound behind his back, were also lashed fast to something in the flooring. There was a queer little choke in Millard's breathing as he went out of the room and returned with a bushel basket of shavings. These he dumped on the floor close to the wall. Then again he went out. When he returned he was carrying a can of coal oil. The contents he poured over the shavings, then against the wall. Next, over the shavings, he heaped three or four newspapers. Jack Benson didn't ask questions. Millard went at it all in such a businesslike way that the submarine boy felt the words sticking in his throat. They couldn't be uttered. Finally, when all else was ready, Millard took the lighted candle out of the candlestick. This candle will burn for thirty minutes yet, guessed the wretch, noting its unburned length with the air of an expert. That will be time enough. Poor lad! He set the lighted candle down on top of the papers, over the pile of oil-soaked shavings. It fitted nicely into a place that the wretch had made ready for it. Then, without a word, the long-legged one tiptoed softly over and bent beside the submarine boy. Open your mouth, he ordered. Of course, Captain Jack didn't propose to do anything of the sort. With one hand, however, Millard gripped the boy's nostrils, pressing tightly. Just a little later, Jack had to open his mouth for air. Thank you, mocked the other, and neatly shoved a handkerchief between the boy's jaws. This he tied in place, and rising, looked down upon a gagged foe. Then, with a last look over at the candle, the long-legged one darted from the room. Left alone, Jack Benson watched that candle on top of the prepared heap. His eyes gleamed with the fascination of terror. When that candle burned down to the right point, it would set fire to the paper. And then, try as he would to bolster his grit, Captain Jack Benson found himself in a fearful plight. At first, he could only stare with terror-dilated eyes at that candle, ever burning, just a slight fraction shorter. While the horror-laden moments were dragging by, Jack heard a step on the stairs behind his head. Then he realized that someone was looking into the room. Then a voice spoke. It was Millard's, though scarcely recognizable on account of its huskiness. It's a fearful thing to do, Benson, but, but I can't help it. If you only knew what it means to me to win. Then followed a moment of utter silence. Jack could hear his own heart beating, as he fancied he could hear that of his persecutor. Then there was another sound, as though some lightweight metallic object had fallen to the floor. Goodbye, old chap. I, I respect you for your calm grit. That's all I can say. There was the sound of a quick turn, then soft footsteps. Jack knew that Millard had fled. He respects me for my calm grit, laughed Jack grimly, almost hysterically. Doesn't the scoundrel know that I'm all but frozen into the torpor of dread? Then, just as suddenly, an anguished, oh, broke from the boy's lips, to be followed instantly by a tremor of hope. For except at the time when interrupted by Millard's return, the young submarine captain had been fighting savagely at the bonds behind his back. Now, he fancied, he heard or felt a single strand giving way. I've got to get out of this quickly, if at all, quavered the boy, staring with wavering eyes at the ever-shortening candle bit. There won't be anything left to do, except bear it, if I'm ten minutes longer at this all-but-hopeless task. After a few frenzied moments of struggle, there was another rip behind him, close to his wrists. Now young Benson fought with rage and frenzied strength. His gaze was ever toward the candle, burning lower. It seemed as if it must communicate its flame to the paper at any instant. There came another ripping sound. 
Captain Jack Benson, though he could not see, felt something giving around his wrists. Frantically he squirmed and twisted with his hands. Then suddenly his wrists fell apart, free. With an exulting throb of gratitude for this well-nigh unexpected boon, Benson forced himself up into a sitting posture. He was shaking now from sheer nervousness. Swiftly, tremulously, he felt in his pockets. My long-legged friend never thought to take my knife, probably because he hadn't the slightest idea I'd be able to use it, thrilled the submarine boy as he forced the blade open. It didn't seem to take an instant now to cut the cords and set his feet free. Jack staggered to his feet. The lighted candle had burned down, now even more perilously close to the paper. But what did the submarine boy care now? At the worst, he could easily run from this house which, he felt certain, was untenanted, save for himself. As soon as he could steady himself well enough, Benson bent and snatched up the burning candle from the tinder-like bed on which it stood propped. Instead of destroying me, he chuckled, this candle will now light me on my way out. At the doorway at the end of the room, Jack Benson, by some strange chance, happened to remember that slight metallic sound of something falling to the floor while Millard was speaking. Now Jack bent over, holding the candle to aid him in his hunt. Ah, there it was. Yet how utterly insignificant. Nothing but a hairpin. Trifles often lead to something big, though, muttered the submarine boy, dropping the hairpin into his pocket. I've been too much around machinery to despise small things. Candle in hand, Jack quickly ascended through the rest of the house, after finding, in the lower hallway, a stout stick that he picked up. With this club he felt he had a weapon to be depended upon at need. But there was nothing in the rest of the little three-story house to throw any light upon the habits of Millard, or the place for which that worthy had departed. In one upper room Benson found a small mirror hung from a nail in the wall. In this same room was a small trunk, lit up and empty. Back to the basement Jack returned. At the rear he found a small yard. Beyond that a fence, with a gate in it. The gate was unlocked. On a nail at the edge of the gateway, Jack found a fluttering fragment of gray veiling. A woman has left here, thought Jack, holding the fragment of veiling in his hand or else Millard got away disguised as a woman. That trunk may have held women's apparel for the very purpose of such an escape. This rear gateway opened upon a long, narrow alley that led to a street beyond. Having satisfied himself on this point, Benson stepped back into the yard. Hold on. Here's something that will help, muttered the boy, staring down curiously at the ground. It was the imprint of a foot in a wet spot on the ground. As Jack bent over it, he saw the marks of diagonal crisscrossing such as is found in the soles of rubbers. The print is a fresh one. Either Millard wore rubbers away, or some woman has been here who wore them, Jack concluded. Dropping his cudgel, since he would have no use for it, Benson made his way down the alley to the street beyond. At the corner stood a small grocery store, whose proprietor was in the doorway. I wonder, began Jack, whether you saw a woman come down out of this alleyway lately. A tall woman. About twenty minutes ago I saw a tall woman in a gray dress and wearing a gray veil, replied the storekeeper. Was she carrying anything? Some sort of a grip. A suitcase, I guess. Did you ever see the woman before, persisted Jack? The storekeeper shook his head. Which way did the woman go? I don't remember particularly, but I think down that way, replied the grocer, pointing. Jack hurried along. It was a quiet part of the town. None of the people to whom he spoke within the next three or four minutes remembered having seen the tall veiled woman in gray, though some thought they might have. I reckon, wisely decided Captain Jack Benson, that I know just about enough to take my information to Lieutenant Ritter. End of A Lesson in Security and Information
Chapter 8 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. F. Feels Like Thirty Tacks. As agreed, the young West Pointer was in a room at the Grindley House. As this room was equipped with a telephone, the young army man was in touch both with Fort Craven and with the submarine boys, should the latter find anything to report over the talking wire. Here in the room Captain Jack found Ritter, for the boy had felt it best to go direct to the hotel. "'Surely you haven't found out anything as quickly as this?' asked the young lieutenant of engineers, looking up in surprise. "'I've learned a few things,' replied Jack quietly. "'Sit down and let us hear what you've learned.' Jack dropped to the chair, but Lieutenant Ritter, when he heard the news, was so excited that no chair could hold him. "'Jove! And just our luck!' gasped the army officer. "'No policeman in sight.' Now, if you three boys had kept together, but you see, when I dropped from the automobile, I wasn't sure it was Millard. I had had only a glance, and his face was away from me. If you see that wretch again, jump on him wherever he is. I could have done it this last time, Benson nodded, yet I had an idea that, if I followed him, he might lead me to the place where he kept his maps and his other stolen information. And he did, I guess, added Jack, with a somewhat disappointed smile. Wait a moment. I'll try to get Major Woodruff over the wire, muttered Lieutenant Ritter. He may have some orders for us. Major Woodruff was at his home. He heard the message and sent his orders crisply. The Major thinks we had better keep this matter from the police, yet, and do our best to find Millard, either in his own garments or behind that gray dress and veil, announced the Army Lieutenant. Then I wish we had the other boys here, muttered Jack wistfully. At that moment, the phone bell rang. It was Hal reporting, and inquiring whether any word had come from his chum. Mr. Benson is here and I think you'll do well to get here as quickly as you can, replied Ritter. Is there any word? began Hal Hastings. Ting-ling-ling! The phone bell rang, cutting off Hal. The latter had received his orders, and his next concern was to obey them. That was lesson number one in brisk army discipline. Hal was on hand in five minutes. While Jack was recounting to him the adventure with Millard, F. Summers came in. He stood in the background, listening, his jaw gradually dropping until his mouth was wide open. "'You heard how Benson ran into the fellow?' asked Lieutenant Ritter, turning to Summers. "'Yes,' muttered F., disgustedly, "'and I guess I have been enjoying the fool's part of the adventure.' "'How so?' demanded the Army officer quickly. "'I met that same woman. I'll bet a cookie,' growled F., "'and—and and I—' "'Well, sir?' demanded Lieutenant Ritter briskly. "'I carried that bag for her. Carried it nearly two blocks.' "'What's that?' cried Jack Benson, leaping up. "'How—' "'No, I don't believe, on second thought, that I'm the prize fool.' "'Come, come,' directed Lieutenant Ritter. "'Talk up quickly, young man.' "'If you want to hear what I have to say,' retorted F., with a slight flash of his eyes, you'll have to wait until I get around to it. It was serving direct notice on Ritter that army briskness wouldn't do in Neff's case. Well, what have you to tell, demanded the young lieutenant impatiently. I was on my way back here, F continued. Guess maybe I was eight blocks or so away from here. I had been to the hotels that I agreed to visit, and why did you go to the hotels anyway? after you knew Benson had sighted Millard, broke in the army officer. Because it wasn't a sure thing that Jack had seen Millard. He thought so, and so did we. But after we left him, the auto ran along slowly, and we heard no row behind, 
so we guessed that maybe Jack had been wrong in his guess. At least, Hal and I figured it out that way. So I went to the hotels on my list, just the same. And I guess you did, didn't you, Hal? Yes, nodded Hastings. This isn't bringing us very fast to your latest adventure, complained young Ritter. It's your fault, then, continued F. placidly. You asked a question, and I answered it. Well, what about meeting the woman in a gray dress and veil? I met her, retorted F. Could you see through the veil? No. Then how do you know it was Millard? I don't know, F. rejoined. But there are mighty few women as tall as Millard. Besides, this one had rather a long foot and wore rubbers. I noticed that. Huh. This makes me feel like thirty tacks. How did you meet her, or him? asked Ritter. I was crossing a street, maybe eight blocks from here, F. replied, and I saw that tall woman, in gray, slip on the crossing. There was a streetcar coming, and she gave a little yell. I got to her, just in time to pull her, out of the way of the trolley, and to set her on her feet again. Then I picked up her dress suitcase. It struck me that the one I supposed to be a woman was on the point of speaking to me when he, she, seemed to see my uniform and then get a look at my face. Then the party, whether it was he or she, made signs to show that he, or she, was deaf and dumb. The suitcase was heavy, so I offered to tote it along, as I was headed the same way. I thought it was the least I could do for a woman who had just had a great shock. If that was Millard, and I'd bet a torpedo boat it was, how he must have chuckled over the idea of having one of the submarine boys carry his bag for him. How far did you go with this lady? asked Lieutenant Ritter, with a faint touch of sarcasm. Two blocks, replied F. And you left her at a cheap hotel where I can find her again, and I guess it's up to us to start right away. Yes, nodded Jack, and we can't start too soon. It may have occurred to Lieutenant Ritter that he wasn't exactly being consulted. However, he saw that these submarine boys were used to acting swiftly, and he began to believe that they would work better if left to their own devices. So he merely nodded, adding, I'll wait here. I'll hope to have a report before long. F. led his two comrades back unerringly to the cheap hotel. They went straight to the hotel desk, Jack asking bluntly whether any very tall woman in gray and carrying a dress suitcase had registered there. No, replied the clerk very positively. Then they interviewed the porter. He remembered the woman having stepped inside the hotel. She readjusted her veil in the lobby near the doorway. Then she went outside, spoke to a driver, got into his cab, and went away, continued the porter. She spoke to the driver, did she, F. asked. Of course, sir, retorted the porter. You didn't think she made signs, did you? From their talk, the submarine boys were satisfied that it was the same woman whom F. had so gallantly assisted. They were equally sure that this veiled woman in gray was none other than Millard. Do you remember which driver it was whose cab she engaged? Jack asked, turning to hand the porter a dollar. Jack Medway's cab, sir, was the quick answer, and here it comes now. The submarine boys hurried out, transferring their attention to Medway. I'm just back from taking the lady, replied the driver, after Jack Benson had slipped him also a dollar bill. But say, was it a lady or a joke? Why, queried Jack Benson. Well, replied the driver, the voice was pitched high, but there was something peculiar about it. I wondered, at the time, if it was a man rigged and togged out like a woman. Where did she tell you to take her, Jack Benson wanted to know. To Furnham Square. Did you take her to any address there? No, just to the square. Then I waited to fill my pipe, and I saw the woman, if woman it was, walk across the square and get into another cab. If you haven't anything else to do, hinted Jack, suppose you take us to Furnham Square now. Within a few minutes, the three friends were gazing out of a cab window upon the square. It looked like a very quiet residence section. 
There was another cab here, you say, that took your last fare from this square, asked Jack. Yes, there is a fellow who has a regular stand here. It's his cab, replied Medway. Let us know, then, when that particular driver gets back here, begged Jack. We'll sit here in your rig and wait. Medway grinned. Waiting, as well as driving, meant money for him. Fully an hour and a half dragged by. Jack was beginning to wonder if it would not be better to give up this present clue to the chase, when Medway, leaning down from his box, called quietly. That's the other fellow and his rig coming back into the square now. As soon as he stops, directed Benson, drive us over alongside. Don't say anything to him. Let me do the talking. In a moment more, Jack was out on the sidewalk, talking earnestly with the driver just returned. You've had a long trip of it, guessed Jack, noting the warm condition of the horses. You bet, nodded the other driver. Just got back from taking that tall woman in gray somewhere. Yep. But do you call it somewhere? I'd call it most anywhere. How far was it? asked Jack. What do you want to know for? demanded the Jehu, looking with sudden sharpness at his questioner. Because we'd like to go to the same place that you took the woman, returned Benson promptly. Ha! Huh. I took her for three dollars. I wouldn't go over that trip again for less than five. We'll pay the five and be glad to, proposed Jack Benson, displaying some money. More than that, if you play right fair with us, we'll put another five on top of the first, just as a little present to your horses. You'd better use the young gentleman right, Jim, advised Medway. They're good fellows, and they pay well. Why do you want to go where I took that last party? questioned Jim, with a shrewd look. One of the things that the second five-dollar note pays you for is asking no questions, retorted Jack. Do you want to take up our offer? Yes, if you'll give me fifteen minutes to rest and water the horses, agreed Jim. That'll be all right, nodded Jack. And now, Medway, have we paid you enough? Plenty, cheerfully responded the first driver, taking the hint and leaving. Where did you take that woman? questioned Jack while the new driver got out a bucket for watering his horses. Away down by the sea coast. Know where the Cobtown fishing shanties are? No. Well, Cobtown is made up of three or four little villages of rickety old houses. Some are occupied by fishermen, and some ain't. There's three or four coves down that way fishing craft anchor in. It's a lonely, wild bit of country, and some rough characters among them fishermen. Did you take your fare to any particular house or shanty down at Cobtown? Nope. She got out on the road in sight of Cobtown and walked along toting her old grip. What kind of a grip was it? An old brownish suitcase. That's the one, nodded F. As the driver busied himself over his team, the submarine boys drew aside to talk over their new information. I reckon we're going to be too late, grumbled Captain Jack. What makes you think so? Hal inquired. Fishing villages, smacks, and fishermen, answered Jack gloomily. Fishermen are a daring, reckless lot of fellows. They'll take a craft anywhere, in any kind of weather, for money enough. Fellows, I'm afraid Millard has hired a smack and started up or down the coast. Then we've got a craft that can chase any smack on the Atlantic coast, declared F. stoutly. Of course if we knew which craft to overhaul and had the authority to do it. Authority? Then what's the matter with the people at the fort? demanded F. Their authority runs only on the land. Besides, by the time we got through the red tape and got started, any smart smack in a good wind would be forty miles the other side of the horizon. Are you going to take this long drive, then? asked Hal Hastings, rather dubiously. Yes, declared Jack Benson promptly. Hal, old fellow, any trail is best where it's freshest. I reckon you can get in now, gents, if you want, called the driver. Seated in the cab, the submarine boys set out to meet whatever might be before them in Cobtown. Had they possessed the gift of prophecy? However, none of us possess that. End of F. Feels Like Thirty Tacks